So hello everyone and uh, wel uh, welcome uh, to this online roundtable organized by the Westphalia in the Middle East program of the Center for Geopolitics on the history of women's role in activism in peace processes, diplomacy and human rights in international politics from the First World War to the 21st century. Um, thank you all for joining us today and I want to especially thank our speakers. Uh, Professor Ingrid Sharp, Professor Noah Robinson, and Dr. Jennifer Thompson. My name is um, Anaita Aryan, and I'm a research associate at the Center for Geopolitics uh, here at uh, the University of Cambridge. And uh, we have a fantastic lineup today of uh, speakers that are joining us from different parts of the world. Uh, well, mostly actually two parts, <laughs> I would say, from the United States and the, and the United Kingdom, uh, in order to share their knowledge and expertise with us about the history of women's role in activism uh, in international politics, or rather uh, the her story of international politics since the end of the First World War. And um, I'm gonna start with introductions of our speakers. So Professor Ingrid Sharp uh, is a professor of German uh, cultural uh, and gender history at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. She holds a PhD from the University of Leeds in gender cultural representation in the First World War. Um, she's currently chair of the Women in German Studies uh, in the United Kingdom and holds also a senior fellowship in the senior Elizabeth List Fellowship Program at the University of Graz. Um, where she focuses on war, welfare, and gender politics uh, in local and global dimensions. Her research and teaching focus on uh, dissenting voices, especially feminist anti-war perspective. Her recent book publications include with Matthew Stibbe and Korean painter, uh, Socialist Women and the Great War, 1914-1921, and A Cultural History of Peace, 1815-1920. Um, so, Next, we have also Professor Rob, uh, Nova Robinson. She's an Associate Professor of History and International Studies at Seattle University. Her research is situated at the in intersection of women's history, Middle Eastern history, and the history of international government uh, governance. And she's currently preparing her book manuscript, Truly Sisters, Arab Women and International Women Rights for publication. She's also the co-editor with Bonnie Smith of the Routledge Global History of Feminism, and she has published articles in International Journal of the Middle East Studies, the Arab Studies Journal, Science, and the Journal of Middle East Women Studies. So also a warm welcome to Professor Nova, uh, Nova Robinson. And last, but certainly not the least, uh, we're joined today by Dr. Jennifer Thompson. She's a senior lecturer in comparative politics at the University of Bath, and uh, from well, recently she became the uh, principal investigator on the SCRC new investigative project, Gender in Foreign Policymaking, uh, the Academic and Policy Implications of Feminist Foreign Policy. And her work focuses on gender and foreign policy, the United Nations Women, Peace and Security Agenda, women rights in post-conflict, uh, divided societies and reproductive rights. Her work has been published in, amongst other international studies review, International Studies Perspective, the British Journal of, Interna uh, of Politics and International Relations, and the International Political Science Review. So thank you very much to all our very esteemed speakers today for joining us. And without further ado, I would like to uh, turn the microphone to Professor Sharp. Right. Um, so thanks a lot for the introduction and, and for the invitation. I'm particularly looking forward to hearing what the other two panellists um, have got to say. But I'm going to talk about the historical roots of um, women's anti-war activism uh, in the First World War and then talk about um, events in Germany that uh, happened only very recently. Um, so in before 1914, there were three international women's organizations. Um, you had the Socialist Women's International and then two bourgeois liberal organizations, the International Council of Women and the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. Uh, and membership of these was growing. And uh, I've quoted Sybil Oldfield there, who said that it wasn't just international, but positively internationalist, a great enthusiasm for working um, internationally. All these groups were anti-war, 
but the liberal progressive organizations based their anti-war stance on a, a rather vague and, and not very well articulated belief in women's natural pacifism. And the issue wasn't central to their priorities. But this was all changed in August 1914, um, you know, quite abruptly. And you found that in all the combatant nations, the overwhelming majority of organized women suspended their international contacts for the duration of the war. And they can um, and it was only a tiny minority um, that opposed the war. The rest of them were engaging in patriotic war work and, and supporting um, their the respective governments. Um, these opposing minority, these anti-war minority, um, mainly came from the international suffrage movement, and they saw working for peace and the prevention of future wars uh, as inextricably linked with their aim for female suffrage. Uh, without the influence of women in government, there would be no or there'd be a, a weaker moral impulse for peace coming from women. But on the other hand, political rights meant little if war was going to destroy the progress towards a fairer and more representative society. Um, when it became clear that the meeting of the suffrage alliance that had been planned for Berlin in 1915 couldn't take place, an alternative Congress was planned jointly by these anti-war women, um, and they worked internationally still. Um, uh, it was founded by women in Holland, neutral Germany, not neutral, Belgium invaded Hungary and, uh, and, and England. So it brought together neutrals and belligerents. Uh, and this was reflected in the Congress as well in April 1915. And this is nine months after the start of the First World War, over a thousand women from 12 combatant and non-combatant nations met at The Hague to discuss ways of mediating between the warring sides, stopping the war and finding non-violent ways of resolving future conflict. And as I've said, female suffrage was central to their understanding of what kind of um, future resolution uh, would look like. And so they asked for suffrage and they recognize an urgent need for women to intervene in international affairs. And they sent delegates of women to 14 neutral um, and combatant nations to present their resolutions to statesmen and rulers and urge them to mediate for peace. In May 1919, after the armistice had been signed and the terms of the peace were being negotiated in Paris, many of these same women met again in neutral Zurich uh, in Switzerland. And it was here that the name, um, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom was chosen. But I would date the founding back to 1915. Um, the terms of the Versailles Treaty, that was the peace treaty between Germany and the victorious powers had just been announced um, on May the 7th, 1919. And the women um, worked very quickly um, on reading them and responding to them. And, you know, they strongly condemned them. They felt that these terms were harsh and that they would foster resentment and inequality and lead to future conflict. And I've put these up as a contrast where you can see, um, you know, the, the Paris Peace Congress and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Congress. Unfortunately, I think that I've mixed up the two at the bottom, um, but it should show all men meeting in Paris and all women meeting in Zurich. Um, I mean, it's a slight exaggeration to say only men were in Paris. There, there were representatives of the women's organizations, but they weren't allowed to address the meeting or, or be part of the decision-making. They were lobbying groups. So the women of the Wilp saw war as catastrophic to the whole of humanity, but especially to women. And they contrasted themselves with the statesmen, um, men who saw war as a legitimate tool in international politics. And they made a strong case that a gender perspective, especially the inclusion of women's experience, was central to the understanding of the causes of the war and creating systems that could bring about a lasting peace. And this formed the basis of women's claim to political influence within nations through the suffrage, 
and to a wider inf um, female influence on the international stage via the international women's organizations and the newly founded League of Nations. And women's lobbying had secured access for women, at least in principle, to all um, the, uh, the, uh, the roles uh, that, that were open um, within the League of Nations. So that was a, a major success uh, for the women. Um, and it paved the way for their representation on the international stage. So even in countries where uh, they didn't get the suffrage at the national level, the such as the French women, were able to work on the, um, inter um, the international stage through lobbying the League of Nations. Or um, And the women didn't wait to be invited by the men. They sent them their thoughts. No one asked for their thoughts, but they got their thoughts. And uh, they added a women's charter, quite a long document um, for good measure. And their suggestions for inclu improvement included allowing defeated nations to join the league, so greater inclusivity. They wanted immediate disarmament and abolition of conscription in all nations as a condition of membership and the guarantee of the rights of minorities and to national self-determination. Um, their key demand, of course, was full political rights and social and economic equality for women. Um, so we can see that their analysis was aimed not just at stopping the current war, but understanding the causes and creating conditions for a sustainable peace. And, you know, even by today's standards, but especially considering the environment that they were working in, it's a remarkably forward looking vision and it's based on ideas of social justice and gender equity. Their vision of war went far beyond combat. They knew it wasn't just the fighting, that they had a more capacious understanding of what war meant, and likewise, a more capacious understanding of what peace meant. It meant much more than just the cessation of violence. And if you look at the resolutions, they anticipate present day principles of human security and of positive peace. And they are they do rest on a social justice and human rights discourse that does take account of women's gendered experience. And bringing us up to date, really, um, these women were mocked and vilified. They were accused of naivety as well as treachery. And I want to talk a bit about what's happening in Germany um, much more recently. Uh, and I know that Jennifer's going to be talking about feminist foreign policy. Well, this is something that's been adopted by Germany. Um, it was announced in November 2021. It was a uh, subject of negotiation um, by the Green Party. They're in coalition with the governing um, S left liberal SPD, but it was the Green Party that insisted on um, feminist foreign policy. And the policy is very strongly associated with this woman, Annalena Baerbock, who's the leader of the Green Party. And she is the first ever female foreign minister of, um, of Germany. Um, for her, it means a widening of the understanding of security beyond military security to encompass the experience of women and other marginalized groups. And at its heart are the three R's, rights, human rights for all, and the removal of barriers to accessing justice, representation, um, specifically aiming for 50-50 uh, gender um, parity in political and diplomatic representation and resources. She's working with the Ministry for the Environment, which is also woman-led, to ensure equal access for resources. So initially, 85% of all aid that's going to be granted is subject to gender budgeting and only awarded to projects with gender with a gender equality dimension. It's highly contested. Baerbock is constantly having to defend herself against accusations that it's incompatible with national security, and particularly since Putin's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, 
even those who are sympathetic to the approach feel that the policy should be suspended in favor of more traditional security priorities, different models of wartime leadership. And they say that the time for gendered approaches is once the enemy has been defeated in the normal way, so militarily. And I'd like to end by um, drawing your attention to some very recent events in Germany, and they are relevant to this discussion. Um, the Manifesto for Peace, written by these two women, uh, Die Linke, it means the left, politician Sarah Wagenknecht, and the old school feminist journalist Alice Schwarzer was launched on February the 10th. And they used all the social medias as well as the mainstream media to, to launch it. Um, the manifesto has been signed by about 750,000 people online, so it's not insignificant. Um, it does have points in common with the Wilps call to The Hague in 1915, um, in that there's inclusivity within a clear framework. Um, this is controversial as well. I could say more about it later if people want to ask. But uh, they say anyone who sincerely, the German phrase is reinen Herzen, so with a pure heart, desires peace, is welcome to sign and is welcome to join the rally, which happened on, on Saturday as well. Um, you know, that's similar to The Hague, that if you could sign up to pacifist pro-subject policies, anyone, and, and we're a woman, anyone could come along. Um, they use the evocation of the suffering of mothers and children, of rape as a West weapon of war, of loss of life and the destruction of community in similar ways. And at the rally, Schwarzer echoed the Wilp in calling the war the pinnacle of destructive male politics and a, an act of madness. She called it uh, Gipfel des Männlichkeits. Vans, which means what I just said. And the public and media, media response used the British, uh, the loan word shitstorm, which I think evokes, it's quite comparable. Um, the women accused of naivety or treachery, either they don't understand the consequences of their actions or they're deliberately acting in Putin's interests. So, so, so far, so similar, but there are significant differences. The first is, of course, the context. 110 years ago, women didn't have access to influence at any level within the state, certainly not as MPs and government ministers. The second is positionality. The women who met at The Hague came from countries who were at war or um, neutral countries. They talked directly from their own experience, um, whereas the manifesto and the speeches at the rally foreground German needs, German interests, German wishes. So it's a positionality from the outside, it's external. Um, the third is agency. Ukrainian people are characterized as victims um, in this scenario. There is a question in the manifesto, what does solidarity with Ukraine mean? But there is no attempt to answer that by consulting Ukrainians themselves. There is no representation of Ukrainian women as agents of change, just as, as victims. Um, and then there is a, a problem with both sides-ism. The manifesto states that peace negotiations are not capitulation, but require compromise on both sides, uh, which is less convincing when there's a clear aggressor that's invaded a smaller nation state. And to compare this with Wilp's own open letter on Ukraine, um, I mean, just very briefly, it centers Ukrainian agency via a, a gender lens, um, and it roots calls for peace in a deep understanding of sustainable peace building as a long-term as well as a short-term project. Um, it avoids both sidesism, and it also avoids using the rather emotive term peace negotiations, which many people object to because it suggests that, you know, the war is over, the war is still ongoing. So they use instead the term international mediation and conflict resolution, de-escalation, um, rather than uh, compromises are needed on, on both sides. So, I mean, as I've outlined, the WILP set out key elements of its analysis, priorities and strategies over 100 years ago, but under very different circumstances. Yet we can still find lessons for today in their response to World War One, and these underpin and uh, the approach and analysis of the contemporary WILP 
on ways to understand the elements and attitudes that lead to war and those that can bring it to an end in sustainable ways in line with social justice, at the centre of which is still gender justice. Great, uh, Ingrid, thank you so much. That was so fascinating. Uh, uh, thank you for elaborating on that point. So um, I would like to give the floor now to uh, Nova. Um, so it's all yours. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be with you today. And much thanks to the Center for Geopolitics and to Anahita for organizing this rich and informative roundtable. My task today is to share information about how women from the Global South shaped or attempted to shape the formation of the international women's rights regime at the League of Nations. I'll admit I did not set out to study the League of Nations. Like many of you, <laughs> Probably, I saw the League of Nations as a failed institution, and I did not think much about its role in shaping women's organizing in the early 20th century. My path to the League started in an elevator at the Bibliothèque Marguerite Durand, a feminist archive uh, in Paris. I, was, I shared the elevator with an Italian scholar whose name, in fact, I never got, quite regrettably, who told me I would not find much about Arab women's internationally oriented activism in archives in Rome, and I'd have better luck in Geneva especially if I went to the League of Nations archives. I took her advice and I changed my ticket and I traveled to Geneva. And for the record, she was right. There were not many traces of Arab women's activism in archives in Rome. Arab women were much more present in the League of Nations archives, as were the letters and petitions from Indian and Chinese women many, and many other women from other parts of the colonized world were also scattered throughout the League's archives. The attempts of women from the Global South to shape the League of Nations policies, especially, but not exclusively, around issues connected to women's lives, is the subject of my second book manuscript, The Woman Question, The League of Nations and the Internationalization of Women's Rights. Given that we want to leave plenty of time for discussion, I will offer a brief history of how women's rights were internationalized at the League of Nations before sharing an example about how a Lebanese woman attempted to change the system to better accommodate alternative systems of women's rights. The elite white women, mostly Protestant uh, from the North Atlantic, who led and populated the big international women's organizations uh, that Professor Sharp already introduced us to, the International Council for Women, the International Women's Suffrage Alliance, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, uh, as showcased uh, by the previous presentation, had clout and connections with the architects of the League of Nations. These organizations profess to speak for the world's women and use their affiliations with international women's organizations in the colonized world to gain traction at the League. But those affiliates did not feel the organizations act accurately reflected their wishes. Women from the colonized world started to question the internationalness of these international coalitions by the 1920s. And indeed, by the late 1920s, new forms of international alliances emerged that decentered Europe. The All Asian Women's Conference, organized by Indian women, is one example, as are the Eastern Women's Conferences, organized by Arab women. They were all trying to create new international alliances that asserted the presence of feminists in other parts of the world and tried to carve out a zone of influence for themselves in the emergent international women's rights community. Despite the resistance from these organizations in the global south or the colonized world, representatives from the ICW, the IWSA, and WILP continued to use their connections in Geneva to speak for the world's women. In 1919, even before the League was founded, International Council for Women representatives pushed the Secretary General-elect of the League to recognize women's expertise and to include women in leadership positions at the League, and even to create a Women's Bureau dedicated to women's issues. The Women's Bureau was a matter, matter of much debate amongst feminists, many of whom were concerned that separating women's issues from other issues, rather than seeing women's issues as connected to other issues, was going to really take attention away from the ways in which women's issues were connected to larger issues, right? Creating a segregated space wasn't going to serve women's issues well, was kind of the dissenting voice there. The pro-voice said, well, if we don't create that bureau, women's issues are going to be forgotten. 
So a, a significant debate happened about whether or not it was important to create a, a feminist space, a women's space uh, within the league. And so they were debating whether or not women's issues would be seen as lesser issues if such a bureau was created. And on some levels, their concerns were prescient. We can look to the United Nations and the creation of UN Women, which has kind of segregated women's issues from larger issues, despite significant attempts to integrate women's issues into the larger UN platforms. We can certainly discuss that more during the question and answer. The feminist requests were ignored, right? No bureau was created. Women weren't allowed to serve in expertise positions. Those were all ignored because women's issues were not seen as international in nature. The men in charge of building the organization clearly conflated the whole canon of women's rights with suffrage, which they saw as a national concern and indeed is a concern germane to nation states. Through continued lobbying, activists were able to get a small concession in paragraph three of Article 7 of the Covenant of the League of Nations that said that employment at the League should be open equally to men and women. Debate ensued about what exactly this meant. Did it mean equal access to all positions within the League, including leadership positions and positions on delegations, or just equal access to the secretarial positions needed to run the vast international bureaucracy? Well, it's not the victory that feminists had sought, they used it wisely to carve out a space for women and women's issues within the League. Over the next decade, feminists worked fastidiously to increase women's employment within the League's organizational bodies. Uh, there was the Council, there was the Assembly, and then there was the Secretariat. Uh, and women carved out a lot of spaces for themselves within the Secretariat or kind of the organizational side of the League. Activists made the most progress securing positions for women, 203 in all, or four times as many as any other committee, on the League's fifth committee. This committee, which dealt with social questions, including the traffic of women and children, became a de facto women's bureau. As a percentage of positions filled at the League, women never surpassed 6% of delegates to the Assembly and 8% of top-level secretariat positions. So yes, they carved out some spaces for themselves, but they were never what we would call today well-represented. One woman, Alexandra Kolontai, a feminist from Russia, served briefly on the council. While women constituted a tiny minority of the membership of the League's leadership bodies, they held a majority of the secretarial and clerical positions within the League secretariat. Almost all of the women who worked at the League of Nations were from Europe, though some were from North America, South America and Asia. As one woman in Geneva later framed it, women's voices rose to no more than a whisper in the assembly of nations. Due to the structure of the League, women from the colonized world were not given independent access to the League until the mid-1930s, when League officials officially conceded that women's issues were indeed international in nature and should be integrated into the purview of the League. The turning point came at the Hague Conference on the Codification of International Law in 1930, when it became clear that a woman married to a man of a different nationality could sometimes be rendered nationless, and a nationless woman was an international problem to be solved. On the back of recognition that women's issues were an international concern, the Assembly took up proposals to study the status of women around the world. In 1937, the Assembly created the Committee of Experts on the Legal Status of Women. I call it the Committee of Experts for short. In doing so, it created an opening for women from the colonized world to directly appeal to the League of Nations, and they used the opening to press for representation on the committee, among other issues. As the League was staffing the committee with legal experts, a coordinated petition campaign arrived at the League of Nations. This transnational petition campaign included representatives from the United States, Western Europe, and the Eastern Mediterranean. And the petitions that were sent did two things. First, they pressed the Committee of Experts to include representation from the East, a category that encompassed all of Asia, in addition to considering Nur Hamada, a women's rights activist from Syria and Lebanon. The borders at the time were really in flux. Uh, she was born a Syrian, later became Lebanese. Uh, so often people will call her Syro Lebanese. Uh, Nur Hamada was an activist uh, who had gained a lot of international uh, recognition. And this is what the 
petitions that nominated Hamada uh, to the Committee of Experts emphasized. They recognized her as a feminist that had grown to great prominence in Southwest Asia. She had organized the Eastern Women's Conferences, which had met in various cities in 1930 and 1932, and were the first attempt to really bring women in Southwest Asia, including Turkey and Iran today, together uh, to talk about the status of women. And Hamada really saw this as an international conference. And indeed, it was, right? Women from different nations did come together. While she did not have legal expertise, she was an expert on the status of women in a region that was not represented on the committee. It's important to emphasize that Hamada was a tenacious activist. After her petition campaign did not receive the response that she felt it deserved, she appealed to the League of Nations in person. And after those efforts failed, she called on feminist allies from the US and Western Europe to support her. The League eventually conceded Okay, we need to respond to Hamada. She's really pushing us for a response. And they eventually told her that she was not a good fit for the committee because the organizations she represented uh, were not international enough. Hamada's efforts to secure Eastern representation on the committee forced the League to define what it meant by international. It had never been pressed on this issue before. Uh, its definitions of international had never really been challenged by most of the Western European or US-based international organizations that were trying to gain representation at the League. Those were seen as international organizations by the League Secretary. Hamada's organizations were not. And so it had to come up with a definition of what it meant an international organization to be. And it asserted that an organization was international if its members represented several countries and that the issues it addressed were international in nature. Hamada, as you might guess, disagreed with the assessment that she did not represent an international constituency. So she set out to prove her international credentials. Ultimately, she really came up against a very entrenched hierarchical and let's say racist uh, international bureaucracy that did not see her as an international actor that fit into their conceptions of who and what an international actor should look like. So her efforts were unsuccessful. And the committee was staffed with four women and three men. So here, on some levels, the committee did listen to the representatives from Europe who were pressing for equal representation of women. Four women, three men was a victory for the North Atlantic feminist organizers at the League. Five of the committee members uh, were from Western Europe. One was from Eastern Europe and one was from the United States. So Hamada's efforts to increase the ranks to include representation from the East, which really would have meant all of the rest of the world, apart from the North Atlantic nations of the US and Western Europe uh, and the representative from Eastern Europe, it would have been you know, important perhaps to include at least a single representative. Uh, but the, the committee dismissed Hamada and really dismissed her pe petition campaign as well with really significant consequences. Hamada's campaign demonstrates that women from the colonized world recognized the League as an important governing body and ensured to work to get themselves represented on that body. They wanted that representation and they worked very hard to get that representation, even though their efforts were unsuccessful. They were blocked from securing representation due to a racist hierarchical thinking that positioned Arab women especially Muslim women, as a population in need of saving. Studying Hamada's campaign demonstrates the importance of focusing on the full spectrum of women's organizing, not just successful efforts. Making space for the failures allows us to see the full extent of feminist visions for the future. The world that we are living in now, right? Feminists from the past were imagining the world that we live in now. And as Professor Sharp emphasized, these were very bold visions for the future that women in the interwar period were putting forth. And regrettably, we didn't listen to them in the interwar period, and we continue to debate some of those very same issues today. I generally avoid counterfactual histories, but for the sake of argument, let's imagine what the world would look like if Hamada's vision had been heeded by the League. Well, the international women's rights system would have been shaped by informed representatives from a variety of world regions. And it's safe to say that if there had been a variety of world representatives at the table, 
the systems that the league had established would have looked different. It would have been more representative of a variety of systems of delivering rights to women, not just those found in the civil and common law legal traditions, the legal systems that inform the liberal international women's rights system enforced today. It would have been a more representative system at the League had they listened to Hamada and indeed the women supporting her campaign. This petition campaign nominating Hamada was unique, but many other feminists and women's rights organizations from the colonized world were also active in pushing the League of Nations to be more expansive in how it framed and delivered rights to women. My book manuscript exposes the extent of these efforts, revealing that the League was an important nexus of feminist organizing in, inter in the interwar period, and not just for women's organizations based in the colonizing nations of the North Atlantic. While the League failed as an organization, it did not fail in creating a blueprint for international governance, and especially for international women's rights but the blueprint it created failed to represent the voices and perspectives of women from the colonized world. The effects of this failure continue to be felt in the structure and delivery of international women's rights today, as the United Nations adopted the League's framework for the international women's rights system. Indeed, one of the representatives from the Committee of Experts on the Legal Status of Women later served on the first UN body dedicating to studying the status of women, she brought a lot of the ideas with her, but ultimately informed the UN that it should erase its connections to the League because of the taint of failure of the League. So there are direct connections between the League systems of women's rights and those adopted by the UN. Indeed, because of this kind of wholesale adoption of these systems and the ways in which the League borrowed from the failures, uh, rather the UN borrowed from the failures of the League, Hamada and other women who had been active in lobbying the League of Nations in Geneva had to begin their efforts again, this time in New York City, and directing their efforts to the UN and trying to change the systems at the UN. Efforts to diversify the structure and content of the international women's rights system are ongoing to this day. I would be happy to talk about the ripple, ripple effects of the League's shortcomings in how it shaped the international women's rights system and in the question and answer session of our session today. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Nova. That was absolutely fantastic and illuminating. Uh, I very much look forward to reading your book <laughs> and of course also to the q and A. I've already written down my questions. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, we move uh, to Jennifer. Uh, it, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Anahita. Let me just drop my slideshow. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the invitation um, to be part of this panel. And it's really lovely to present alongside two historians. It's really interesting to hear different perspectives um, on uh, mutually mutual areas of interest. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so building on what we've heard from um, our previous two speakers, I'm going to kind of bring us up to the present day and think about the advent of feminist foreign policy in the last decade or so. Um, and as we've been talking about, gendered issues have slowly but surely been moving from the margins to the mainstream of international political discussions. And as been mentioned previously already, the, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda of the United Nations um, is one key uh, exemplar of that, as is uh, UN Women, as we've been talking about too. But what we're seeing now um, with the advent of feminist foreign policy is states going even further than that and adopting a consciously feminist um, approach to um, their foreign policy making. Um, as of this year, there are currently 13 countries that have adopted or have said that they are aiming to adopt a feminist foreign policy. And that starts with Sweden back in 2014, very much at the vanguard of this as an idea um, and builds all the way up to Slovenia earlier this year, a country which has declared that it's going to or is in the process of adopting um, a feminist foreign policy. Um, and we can see that uh, you know a, a vast array of very different countries um, joining this group of nations that are using this language to refer to their foreign policy. At the same time, though, as it has grown, 
um, in popularity, FFP remains quite unclear in terms of what it is, in terms of its practical and um, political and, and policy implications. It's generally quite poorly defined and understood, um, and there's not really a sense of a common definition or a set of policy areas that it coalesces around. So unlike, for example, something like the UN's WPS agenda, where we have a, a series of mutually agreed texts and legal texts, um, FFP doesn't have that. Simply put, if a state says we have a feminist foreign policy, they have a feminist foreign policy, okay? There's no specific checklist um, that they have to sign up to. So what I want to do um, in this presentation today is think a little bit more about that. What does FFP mean when these states are using this language? What do they mean by it? And what are they trying to achieve under this umbrella? What are the central areas of focus that we're seeing emerge with this agenda, if there are any? Um, and do they differ across the different national contexts that have adopted it so far? And so I'm going to do that by looking at five of these countries, um, and these are the five countries that have produced the most comprehensive written documentation so far. So that's Sweden, Canada, France, Mexico and Spain. Um, and I'm drawing here on um, some research that I had published uh, last year in the European Journal of Politics and Gender. So I want to start off um, with the very basic question of what do these states mean by feminism? What do they mean when they use the language of feminism and gender equality? And in these documents, they often start off by giving definitions um, of feminism or gender equality. Um, and for some of these states, notably Sweden and Spain, when they talk about feminism, they mean a very kind of classical liberal understanding of a power differential between women and men, and FFP as being a means to address that. In other countries, though, we see a broader kind of more structural understanding um, of feminism and gender equality. So Mexico, for example, adopts a, a much wider um, definition. It talks about substantive equality, structural inequality, individual human rights. Canada equally talks about uh, women and men, but also gender diverse people, and it uses the language of intersectionality too. So even just at that basic understanding of, of what do these countries mean by feminism, we're seeing some subtle but very important differences. For some, we're seeing that kind of classic liberal understanding of, of women, men and inequalities there. For other, others, we're getting a much broader um, attempt at understanding feminism. In most most, though, what we are seeing is a sense of the instrumental um, impact that feminism or gender equality can have on these countries' foreign policy goals. So, for example, I'm using the example of Sweden here, but this is something that crops up across these policies. Sweden talks about gender equality as a goal in itself. But it also acknowledges that that goal will help it to achieve its, its broader foreign policy ambitions as well. So that kind of instrumental and um, practical, useful understanding of feminism is also very present um, across these different nations' FFP. In terms of how these countries want to go about actually practically implementing um, uh, feminist foreign policy, there's a number of things um, that emerge across uh, these different countries. First off is a commitment to multilateralism and international treaties and obligations. Um, and given what we've heard already from our previous speakers, I think we can kind of see the historical trajectory and roots of that. But the European countries are very keen to talk about the EU, the ways in which they will use the EU to further FFP. Um, um, all countries talk about their United Nations commitments, again, in terms of the WPS agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals. And we also see a lot of discussion of the various international human rights treaties and international treaties more broadly um, that these countries are uh, signed up to. Interestingly, they also talk quite extensively about internal change, okay? There's a lot of reference to changing the internal culture of the various foreign ministries of these, of these countries, and also greater protection of female citizens um, abroad when traveling, which is interesting. Um, something else we see emerging is the idea of leadership. Um, all of these countries are very eager to talk about leadership and their, their role in providing leadership around FFP. And they talk about that with, with two different meanings. Firstly, is the idea of leadership as 
um, the perceived role that these countries have in promoting FFP on the world stage and in kind of being experts and, and pathbreakers in this area. So Sweden in particularly um, in its documentation is very eager to, to, to talk about itself as being the kind of at the vanguard of establishing the first feminist foreign policy. But states also talk about leadership in the ways in which FFP is going to be addressed coherently across their governments as a whole. So leadership, again, also with that internal dimension of how the administration is going to, to function around FFP. And then lastly, and interestingly, we also see the language of gender mainstreaming cropping up a lot in these policies, which I think is important to note, given that gender mainstreaming is quite an accepted, quite quite a dated concept, actually, um, really, um, when, when we're thinking about uh, gender and public policy, a, a policy which has its roots going back to the early 1990s. And then finally, I just wanted to think about the substantive areas. What, what is the stuff of FFP? What are these countries concerned um, about in terms of their activities. Firstly, again, the United Nations Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Um, there's a clear trajectory between the WPS agenda and FFP, so I think that's perhaps unsurprising. Similarly, um, uh, uh, the discussion of violence and sexual and gender-based violence and violence against women and girls. Again, that's a very accepted topic um, across um, international policy making for some decades, so it's perhaps again unsurprising that we see that cropping up in the context of FFP. Human rights are also explicitly central across these documents. Um, as Ingrid talked about already, rights is one of the, the core three things that Germany is talking about in its feminist foreign policy and it's echoing um, the Swedish language there. The documents also talk extensively about participation, women's participation, and um, particularly in the context of peace processes in relation to WPS, but also women's social and political participation more broadly. And then finally, the policies all stress the importance, interestingly, of economic rights and women's rights to economic participation too. So where, where does that leave us? That's a quick overview of, of what we're seeing across FFP, across some of the kind of main players um, in this arena. And I think it suggests some key points of, of commonality that are emerging here. And firstly, I think it shows interestingly that in, in many ways, these policies are not perhaps as novel as might be expected. I think using the word feminist has excited a lot of interest and, and, and has raised questions um, around them. But in many ways, the key substantive areas that we're seeing in these policies are all clearly longstanding um, within global politics. And similarly, that focus that countries are placing on the multilateral system, on the membership of various international bodies, that's not referencing new connections or, or, or new alliances. So there's perhaps not so much innovation here um, as we might expect, um, given either the, the substance or the multilateral tools that seem quite important. Secondly, too, is the, the importance of internally um, facing uh, discussion that we can see across what, what are all explicitly foreign policy documents. These policies seem to be as much about domestic transformation as they are about foreign policy transformation. So I think that leaves us with the question of to what extent are they really presenting a transformative approach to foreign policy, or are they about fixing or changing culture within um, internal bureaucracies? Um, and then lastly, as again, and again, we might um, not be surprised to see this, this is a, a common critique of, of uh, women's rights funding in, in different arenas, but we're not seeing a whole lot of discussion of resources or targets or accountability mechanisms. Um, there's not a, a, a clear sense of budget um, attached uh, to very many of these policies. So I think with those kind of critiques in mind, that leaves us with um, uh, one kind of key question. If, as I've tried to argue here, that FFP in many ways is a repackaging of existing commitments, um, or it's, it's attached to policies that aren't particularly novel, I think the question emerges, well, emerges, well, why? Why bother? Why are states reworking their existing foreign policy in this direction? Why are they committing to an agenda with a feminist moniker, which is potentially controversial and divisive, when there's so little that is new that's being presented? 
And I think in part the answer lies in the current global context in which FFP has emerged. As we've seen through, through invoking FFP, states are re-stipulating their commitment to multilateralism uh, and by extension to the international uh, order uh, writ large. And I think that's noticeable given the context in which these policies have emerged. Okay, the elections of Trump, Bolsonaro, Orban, etc., and the attacks on the international system that have been a part of this, particularly with regards to gender and discussions of gender. And that's something that's very much picked up on in these documents. So I've just highlighted two quotes there from the Canadian and the French document, but that's something that they're definitely aware of and referencing um, in these contexts. And in a similar vein, um, states are also very eager to stress, as I said, the ways in which their leaders or innovators in this area. And I think FFP helps to give these countries what essentially amounts to a brand on the world stage, okay? And the, the feminist descriptor, again, is acting as a signal that states who adopt it are good liberal entities and, and committed to um, multilateralism and the international um, liberal order. So just really quickly by, by way of conclusion, FFP does appear here to stay. Okay, just before I, I came on to um, this webinar this afternoon, I was watching um, another webinar um, at UN headquarters in New York uh, at the Commission on the Status of Women um, on FFP. It's the, the CSW this week, and there are a multitude of events discussing FFP there. So it really seems to have taken hold within international civil society now as well. At the same time, we're also seeing um, some backsliding. So following the Swedish election last Last year, Sweden now no longer uses the term feminist foreign policy. Interestingly, it has said that it will keep the substance of its policy the same, but it's not using the language of feminism, which is, is interesting and something I might want to talk about in the, the Q&A. Um, but uh, uh, broadly speaking, I think FFP is, is here to stay within international policy making. As I've tried to show here, though, um, we can ask questions about how novel or innovative that's actually being in the international space. And so I think that leaves us um, with the question of why, why bother? And as I said, I think that's to do with the anti-gender context in which FFP is emerging, but also this notion of branding and the current kind of zeitgeist moment that feminism is experiencing, particularly in the Western world. But at the same time, many um, feminists and, and cultural commentators have pointed out that this popular feminism is often quite vague and depoliticized. Uh, and to use the words of, of, of Sarah Van Advisor here, it often is as though seeing or purchasing feminism is the same thing as changing patriarchal structures. And I think this is the key danger facing feminist foreign policy as it moves forward. Um, I think there might be a worry that states identify with a kind of label and a brand rather than stipulating clear resourced commitments um, for structural change. Um, and I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your discussion of feminist foreign policy, and uh, and and that was that was very interesting because, um, as you know, there are those uh, scholars that <laughs> completely advocate it, uh, and I think uh, your perspective is uh, probably perhaps one of the few that is a little bit more critical uh, uh, towards it. So uh, I want to first thank you all uh, for, for your presentations that has highlighted the role of women in international politics, or at least the, the question of women in international politics itself uh, since the uh, First World War. Uh, so I want to ask the attendants if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand <laughs> if possible um, or write down your questions. Uh, hopefully we can bring you in so that you can actually talk to, uh, to our speakers and ask them directly your question. Uh, so um, please go ahead, but since I am uh, the moderator, I'm going <laughs> to abuse my uh, <laughs> position and, and start with the, a number of questions. Um, so I... Um, I just uh, first, I mean, uh, I'll start with a question for you, Ingrid. I, uh, I very much enjoyed your discussion of the history of, uh, of women uh, uh, in during the First World War to say with the establishment of wealth and how um, the goals of wealth are kind of reflected in the in feminist foreign policy. Uh, 
And uh, you mentioned in Wagenknecht and uh, Schwarze's cause for peace and their differences with actually the what Wilf has been doing. So um, I was also wondering because um, could you maybe speak a bit about how their um, uh, manifest uh, or pamphlet, so to say, for peace has actually been hijacked by quite right wing extremist groups in uh, in Germany. Um, so I'm, yeah, I wanted to ask you to maybe if you can talk a bit uh, more about that. Um, so maybe it's best that we just first, you know, go by the question and then, you know, in the meantime, maybe the audience wants to also include and then, yeah, so if you want to go for it. Okay, well, the, 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 the manifesto has been signed by 750,000 people. So, you know, amongst those are people who are associated with sort of classical peace movements, like the ones that you, you saw in Germany um, in the 1980s. It's been signed by people who just want the killing to stop. So it's, um, but it's also been signed by some people who are quite associated with right-wing groups such as the Alternative für Deutschland, the AFD. And I think in the rally, this is even more noticeable because, um, you know, partly because the invitation was to everyone. It was intended to be inclusive. Anyone who sincerely, with a pure heart, can come along and, and wants peace, and who doesn't, can come along to this rally. They did ban um, certain symbols of right-wing extremism. And they said, you know, we will not have any Russian flags. We will not have any flags that depict Ukraine within, um, you know, with bits missing basically, you know, that, that acknowledge the status quo. Ukraine now looks like this because of the, the, the Russian invasion. So, um, they did try and distance themselves from some of the more extreme right wing, but it, it has been noticed in discussion that Wagenknecht in particular did not mention the IFD as a group that she did not want present. So, you know, she's saying we don't want Reichsbürger who are extreme right. We don't want um, violent nationalists but she stopped short of saying, um, you know, we we don't want the Alternative für Deutschland, um, you know, to, to join in. So you say hijacked, um, and certainly I'm not saying that this um, peace manifesto actually wanted to attract the far right, but I'm wondering whether it did enough to distance itself from the far right um, positions and there are also you, you know I'm I'm sort of it, it only happened quite recently and while I'm critical of certain aspects of it you know I don't know how it could it is going to develop um you know 750,000 people you know you you can't dismiss them um but on the other hand there are aspects within the manifesto that that do worry me uh they imply they they with a question mark you know, we know that that's a, a, a difficult, that, that is a, a quite a traditional way of um, pushing away criticism, saying, well, I'm only asking questions. And the question that they ask is, you know, does Zelensky aim at a total defeat of Russia, question mark, you know, which is a false equivalence. It's sort of placing a defense of territory with, um, you know, with, with, with want, wanting to you know, it's it's almost equating it with a war of aggression, uh, and one of the other criticisms that has been levelled is that uh, instead of Aufstand für den Frieden is Aufstand lass mich bloß in Frieden, um, which means you know instead of a, you know a rally for peace, it's a rally to I just want to be left in peace, and some of the wording is very much from the perspective of Germans. You know, we are the 50 percent who don't want we to weapons to be sent to Ukraine. Um, you know, so we have a right to say stop the war in Ukraine because we Germans are uncomfortable with it. And again, you know, as I say, this 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 isn't in the spirit 
of um, the original more in inclusive attitude to feminist peace. So I'm struggling with it. Um, you know, I can see the contradictions. I wanted to to bring it more into the line of, you know, well, this is a, a grassroots peace movement. Can we compare it with with the WILP? And I, um, in 1950, I don't think you can really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think there is a question from the uh, audience. Um, so I, I would like to try to bring uh, Thomas in. Is that possible? I am asking uh, our admin. <laughs> um, that... Let me check. That would be... Uh... Thomas? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just check. Thomas. Yeah. Please. Okay. Thomas, uh, welcome. And... Please go ahead. Um, thank you. I mean, I'm not sure I can expand significantly upon what I wrote, but um, I, I read um, Scott Shapiro and Una, Una Hathaway's um, book on the the internationalists uh, a few years ago, uh, possibly more recently than that. But uh, about the um, uh, the pro, you know, their contention that that the Kellogg Briand Pact kind of is is an an under acknowledged artifact of the prohibition of the use of force in the UN Charter um, 20 years later. Um, and I wondered whether the movements that Professor Sharp has, has um, been studying played a role during the late 20s. As I, as, I, as I recall, the process of negotiating the treaty was, was probably fairly high political. I'm, I'm not sure there was a significant civil society movement pressuring around it at the time but i wonder after it was adopted whether there may have been some uh campaigning by uh groups such as those she's she's uh, spoken about to encourage states to adopt or or, or ratify the treaty okay thank you thomas Um, Professor Sharp, would you like to answer? Uh, i would love to answer but i'm afraid i can't really um you know, it, it's, I haven't made a particular study of the kellogg Brian Pact, and, um, you know, it, it, it would have been subject to the general atmosphere created by the women that were pushing um, a, for a gender-aware approach to peace with, you know, li little but some measurable success. Uh, so I can't really speak to that. It was in, in 19, 1928, and I've, I've really focused much more on what was going on in in um 1915 1919 and and then jumping to the present day really so i'm sorry that falls into a bit of a gap but, but i i'm happy to do that gap a little bit um so a uh, really wonderful uh question thomas thank you so much for raising it uh so women were actually present at the negotiations uh they were active in buttonholing uh the the individuals who were establishing the uh beyond pact um the the men there were so frustrated with women's presence that they tried to get women to be banned uh from the negotiations uh it didn't work um women were persistent uh continued to try to push down the doors and get themselves present and when they their entrance was kind of denied they established phone trees uh and they shamed the men uh for denying their entry uh there were women who were jailed for trying to kind of participate um and the women who were jailed again another kind of global kind of phone tree campaign to try to bring attention to the way in which women were being cut out of these negotiations so women were active in trying to get access that access uh was denied but not because they didn't try and they tried to really shame the male leaders for cutting them out uh, and then yes uh, as you suggest uh women did participate in trying to promulgate uh the the pact and get more more signatures thank you so much nova um uh i i have a question across the entire board because when i would connect all of your um presentations and discussions it seems to be that um, unfortunately, every time when it concerns uh, women issues, they're, um, well, I mean, I, I will stop using the word hijacked, but they're being instrumentalized for other purposes. 
And um, uh, to certain, I mean, there have been some successes that have been booked, uh, such as the establishment of wealth. But then Nova also points out how um, within the League of Nations system, women uh, from the global south or from the colonized world were actually excluded from participating and being represented, which has continues to have ripple effects as a result of which we're we have now UN women or women peace and security in which women are not completely integrated into international politics and in all of its facets but like uh, treated as a special category so to say as a residue category and then when you look at feminist foreign policy you see again that th there there is this um level of uh branding so to say and maybe also perhaps virtue signaling so we're good liberal international order uh um citizens but at the end of the day it really doesn't uh it is not really per se concerned with women um or would that would be would that be a to um negative conclusion so to say and um how to navigate through that for the present, but also for the future. So if any of you want to take that up. I can just start, I guess, by saying that I was just struck by the similarities uh, that Dr. Thompson brought up. Uh, so right now we're in a moment where uh, feminist uh, foreign policy, FFP, is becoming something that's trendy. Uh, nation states are adopting it. And, you know, as you're noting, maybe not actually implementing the changes, but they're adopting that framework. And I, you know, I, I support and uh, appreciate your skepticism about kind of whether or not that's going to lead to much change in the international realm. Uh, but in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, nation states were doing the same thing. It wasn't with feminist foreign policy, but it was with regards to issuing women's rights on the national level, especially with regards to suffrage. It was an effort to uh, get the international community to, as Dr. Thompson is emphasizing in the present day, see them as good liberal actors, good participants, equal participants. Indeed, it was many nations from the global south that started to grant suffrage to women as a way of saying we are equal nation states on the international level. And so we do see that women's rights are uh, instrumentalized and they are utilized uh, in the framework of international geopolitics, international politics uh, for the goals of the nation states. And it's really where feminist activists come into play because they do support their nation states extending these rights. And then they try to call their nation states out and say, well, you've said you've done this, now implement it, right? So feminists do use those international promises on the domestic level. It doesn't always work out, but right, that international posturing does sometimes have effects on the status of women in individual nations. But I, I, I as far as how we change that pattern, since it's now kind of has a long kind of century long history, I don't know how we change that pattern, uh, but I do think that um, we do see common patterns of nation states uh, utilizing and posturing with regards uh, to the status of women uh, and using that for their own uh, their own gain. Um, and just pointing you to the examples of Turkey uh, granting suffrage to women, Iran granting suffrage to women uh, in the 1920s and 30s as a way of positioning themselves on the global stage. Can I just uh, say, say something maybe about Germany? That um, I mean, the, the policy is very associated with Annalena Baerbock, and it's partly um, she she uses the term feminist foreign policy, and it's there in in English. They don't say feministische Außenpolitik very often. It's feminist foreign policy to to place them in this international um, group of the good guys, you know, the uh, the liberal ones, as as as, as Jennifer said, um, but. Uh, so it's a provocation, and it's also a you know a, a statement of intent. It also is a very good trigger word to reveal the existing tensions within um, you know quite a liberal society in Germany. Um, the response to people because of the word feminist has been you know really quite extreme you know in social media, but also within Parliament there have been, there have been some very full and frank um, exchanges of views with people saying, you know, what is this nonsense? You know, and Annalena Baerbock having to defend herself 
um, you know, within Parliament um, as well as to, to, to the public. But what she says is that women's rights are a barometer of the state that societies are in. So she's deliberately taking the position of women as an indication of the health of the nation. But she says that feminist foreign policy is not directed only at women. Um, you know, and you might think it's good for men too, would be what she would say next if she was trying to win friends. But what she says is, you know, it's also good for other marginalized groups, you know, who are at the margins of society because of their religion, disability, gender, sexual identity. And all these are, are, are words which are quite triggering to people who are deeply embedded in, in the culture wars. Um, as well, so I think the use of feminist policy you you could take you could say values based, or you could even say this is a foreign policy which is directed at equality. But the use of feminist foreign policy, particularly keeping it in English in German, I think is deliberate, and 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 I think is one of the means that Baerbock is using to to flush out those who really think that war should be dealt with by by men and that women should still um, know their place and and shut up about it um, until the war is over and then they can come in and heal the wounds that are, of, of war. Um, you know, that's okay. But having a foreign minister in this prominent position who stuck to, I mean, I hate to say stuck to her guns, it's completely the wrong phrase, but that's all that comes to mind, who, who has stuck to her position and has shown that feminist foreign policy is a tool that she and a priority that she is going to set, despite the fact or simply because they are in the middle of a hot war, um, you know, rather than saying, oh, we'll do this later when this crisis is over, I think is quite interesting and is seen as quite provoking to, to many groups within Germany. Just to, if I can, just to follow up on that, that point about language, I think it is incredibly fascinating that, that that happens in Germany, that the English term is used rather than any translation. But I think it's also important to note that there, there are multiple other states that don't use this language of feminist foreign policy, but are equally active in terms of the substance of what they're doing on the international arena. So, for example, Norway. Norway has um, specifically resisted quite quite smoothly resisted calls to define its foreign policy as feminist saying something along the lines of you know we, we don't need to use that it's more about walking the walk rather than talking the talk like if we're already doing the thing we don't need to, to use the word feminist and there's lots of other countries in in a kind of similar vein Australia for example has recently established I believe an ambassadorial position around promoting gender equality abroad. It's not using that language of feminism, but it's still quite active and still doing a lot of things um, in terms of it, its foreign policy. So um, that there is something happening there as well about countries again being being eager to be seen in a certain light, um, uh, and other countries just quite happy to to do the work um, and and not sort of attract or um, maybe avoid the attention that, that using the, the language of feminism uh, might incur. Thank you so much for that. We have a question from the audience, from Priyanka. Okay, uh, shall I just speak? All yeah. right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk. So I, I was wondering if, and I'm not sure if I missed this and you already touched upon, uh, in the sort of history of women's role in activism, peace processes, diplomacy and human rights, uh, and international politics, and also sort of the feminist uh, foreign policy that you made reference to, how far do women from the global south and the east feature? And also, uh, if in your study of this history of women in peace, uh, you encountered uh, or came across sort of interactions or conversations between uh, you know, the West and the East and the Global North and the Global South. So, I mean, interactions among, or conversations among women, that is, women in peace. Thank you, Priyanka. Sorry, I was muted. Um, who would uh, like to take on Priyanka's question? I think maybe if I, if I say something about the, the WILP, um, you know, uh, early in its uh, its development, and and then Nova can maybe um, be, build build on it a bit more with with slight, slightly um, you know with how it developed later. That I would say that some of the discussion around the WILP when it was first 
founded recognized that there were there were problems of inclusion exclusion you know that it was dominated by western women um and they 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 had as a value they wanted to be inclusive but some of their attitudes were very much um you know along the lines of humanity is developing they had a very sort of teleological approach we are progressing towards a higher plane and some nations are more developed than others um you know so it was a bit of a patronizing hierarchical uh, a- approach that was you know deeply annoying um as, as we as we heard in Nova's presentation to women in the global south who did not see themselves as in need of saving they just wanted a, a, a place at the table so there was that element and there has been criticism of of the wilt because of that um, and their attempts to be international and inclusive sometimes amounted to little more than collecting, you know, oh, we've got someone from China here. And, you know, why don't you wear your national costume? And then we can have photographs of you wearing your national costume. And there's, you know, a wonderful response by a Chinese woman saying, I have better things to do than come along and play dress up doll at uh, at, at your conferences. So I, I think the, the answer is that they they weren't they weren't really terribly aware, but that women from the global south were aware of it and that they were fighting back and they were resisting this um, racial hierarchy and the domination of, of, of Western women. Yes, I mean, uh, Professor Sharpe really, I think, kind of synthesized uh, a lot of the most important points there, that there was a lot of pushback uh, to the dominance of these organizations. I would say that there initially was a lot of hope about these organizations, and then women from the Global South started to attend these conferences, uh, and then they were like, wait, we're not being integrated as equals here, right? This is an organization that's professing equality between men and women, but we're not emphasizing the equality between the world's women. And so women started to splinter away. They did continue to maintain their connections with those organizations because they did see it as strategically important for their campaigns. Those connections, when women from the Global South didn't have a voice at the League of Nations and in other kind of spaces, their representatives, right, the women who were the heads of the organizations that they were members of could sometimes, with a lot of prodding, take their messages to other people, right? But it wasn't a very direct pathway, and there was a lot of mediation there, and women found it very frustrating, but they did keep it open uh, just in hopes that they might be able to get uh, some of their perspectives there. And most of the campaigns in the 1920s, 1930s, early 1940s from the Global South focused a lot on uh, the violence of colonialism. They were very anti-colonial, peaceful forward with regards to their activism within the IWSA, the ICW, and WILF. They said, you know, the actions of your nations are causing unrest, violence in our nations. Please live up to your principles. Please help us support our campaigns for peace. Um, And then in the 1930s, uh, the women's organizations that started to create these international conferences in Asia really started to say, well, why does Europe get to say anything about peace? They just had this global war that destroyed so much. Uh, We didn't do that. We, uh, based off of our religious traditions, have better claims to to peace than the Europeans. And so there was kind of a debate within the feminist global feminist movement about who got to carry the the banner of most peaceful, uh, especially in the wake of, of World War I. Um, if I can jump in here as well, Anita, if that's all right. I, I think on a on a a positive angle in terms of thinking about confrontations between the global north and the global south in terms of feminist foreign policy, um, I think um uh positively feminist foreign policy has quite rapidly transitioned from being a conversation that a select number of Western European and North American states were having to involving um countries from the global south as well. So in that that table that I had on my first slide there, we've seen Libya, Colombia, and um, Liberia all um aiming, all talking about adopting um a feminist foreign policy, Mexico as well, um uh, being one of the kind of key early advocates. Um, around feminist foreign policy. So positively, I think this is something that we're not just seeing the global north talking about. We are seeing this as a a genuinely international conversation. Um, 
on a more negative uh, note, that I feel like I'm being very critical this afternoon, on a more negative note, feminist foreign policy is interesting, I think, because unlike the discussion and, and the history that we've heard from, from Nova and Ingrid, this uh, policy framework really comes top down. It comes from states and it really took civil society by surprise. So I started doing some interviews with Swedish civil society last year and it was fascinating talking to uh, mostly female Swedish civil society advocates who said, oh yeah, I remember the day um, feminist foreign policy was announced because we were in the office and we all just sort of sat around and looked at each other because we didn't know this was coming. It really came out of the blue. This wasn't something that happened after years and years of conversation with civil society around FFP. It was something that the state decided it was going to do. And civil society has kind of nationally and internationally, I think it's fair to say, been sort of playing catch up with the notion of, of what does FFP mean? How do we engage with the state on this? What do we want it to look like? And trying to formulate its own definitions notably more radical definitions, I think, um, of, of, of what FFP is and how to go about engaging with these countries. Um, also, on, on a slightly more negative note, I think it's interesting that across these, these states' policy documents, um, we do see um, quite inclusive language often around feminism, okay, so quite uh, language around intersectionality, language sometimes around um, anti-colonial thinking or decolonization, um, but we also don't see that much kind of consciousness and discussion of the fact that these states often have incredibly violent colonial pasts of themselves to reckon with, okay? Uh, I, I was in um, Canada for a conference a couple of years ago talking about feminist foreign policy. Um, and at the same time that I was there, the main uh, national story in the Canadian press was the, the, the hideous discovery of unmarked graves in residential homes. Um, and Canada really trying to have a national conversation and reckoning um, uh, in terms of its treatment of um, its native populations in the past. Um, and I don't think we really see that those kind of conversations happening um, in feminist foreign policy. We don't see that reckoning with colonial history and colonial presence um, in feminist foreign policy documents. Um, so, yeah, some, some positives and, and some negatives in, in terms of um, uh, uh, relationships and, and developments in relation to the Global South, I think. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, we still have um, some time for one more question left. If, uh, if anyone from the audience would like to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, and if you don't, then I will again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. just oh, yeah. with, uh, with a different observation uh, to just kind of build out uh, uh, Jennifer's really insightful presentation. So the countries that have adopted FFP uh, are many of the same countries uh, that were at the pioneer, like pioneering in granting women rights encouraging women to be participants in international politics early on. And so these nations have a long history of being at the forefront there. And I, I think that that's interesting, right? Sweden was the, the first country to grant women the right to vote, right? I mean, I'm sure this is something that you're familiar with. Um, and uh, Chile was uh, instrumental in making sure that women were represented at the League of Nations. They were the country that pushed that more than anyone, right? So we see these countries having a long history there. And I suppose a question for some other scholar perhaps is to analyze why those countries have continued to have that posturing over the last century. That is a very fascinating question. Just a brief point there. I think that is really, really interesting. But I think it's also interesting that that history doesn't seem to be very present in discussions of feminist foreign policy. It's really being presented as this kind of brand new shiny thing and the sort of long historical trajectory, right? We can we can really very obviously trace a clear trajectory from wealth back in the 1910s all the way up to feminist foreign policy in the present day. Um, and, and it doesn't seem to be so present, which is, is I don't have an answer to why that is, but it's it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would agree with that. Um, and I think that if you look carefully at the vision of society that Wilp had and what, what it thought were the elements needed for creating a sustainable peace, it's often a lot more radical um, and much more transformative than uh, anything that we see uh, at this state level feminist foreign policy. Um, and uh, another thing that that struck me because of uh, some something that, um, that that you said that these are, these are imposed these are imposed policies they're not growing from the grassroots up they they come as a surprise to some of the people who you'd expect to be involved 
And I've noticed that there is a stance of openness, which I, I think is, is, is genuine. Um, you know, the language that is used by Annalena Baerbock uh, can encompass, I don't know, um, you know, I want to work together. This is not a party political point. Uh, and also the fact that it's taken, you know, well over a year um, to to get to the point where there's been enough discussion to really um, come out with a statement of what feminist foreign policy means, you know, shows that there is this open minded willingness to share views. But whether civil society has been involved in that, I mean, that's something I, I simply don't know. Because I, I've noted this openness, um, this willingness to admit that she doesn't have all the answers. Uh, also, to use quite emotional language sometimes, she, she says, it, it, it breaks my heart, um, which is not something you often hear uh, in, in German parliament. But whether that open-minded curiosity, this is truly feminist methodologies, has actually included feminist groups, civil society groups, um, you know, even religious groups or not is something that I think will be my next inquiry. How did, how was this reached or was it just done at parliamentary level? So is she only reaching out in, in the parliamentary sphere to other people who are people of good faith who are working within parliament? Wonderful. Uh, I think we have... Uh... One more question from Thomas, if I'm not mistaken. At least I see a raised hand. So, um, is, uh, if if you have uh, Thomas, um, could you please otherwise type your question, or, um, or maybe that happened accident? I don't know. Uh, so, I'm gonna quickly take like oh, the opportunity to ask uh, one final question. Um, so. Have, uh, okay. Oh, there is Thomas. <laughs> Here he is. Um, <laughs> yes, Thomas, please. Uh, final question for you. Uh, so I had a, um, a a thought that occurred to me as several of you spoke about um, kind of peace building when 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 generalizing around uh, kind of the kind of agenda. And I, I think Professor Sharp did this in in uh, highlighting the more recent examples of language used by Wilf. Um, and then I, I think um, Dr. Thompson also talked about um, peace building as one of you know a number of different terms that get thrown around alongside women, peace and security, etc. And 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 I I wondered my my work is around um, we includes kind of peace building uh, in that SDG sixteen plus kind of way, which seems like. Uh, a potentially more feminized version of um, uh, peace building than a, a very kind of mid-century um, in, intergovernmental peace and security kind of conversation. And I wondered to what extent um, panelists, perhaps um, Dr. Thompson most, most obviously, um, might reflect on the extent to which the way in which peace building and development as two parts of the UN's uh, kind of well, two pillars of the UN's work have to a certain extent been combined or or are now more mutually reinforcing than perhaps they once were and the way in which um, kind of questions of gender equity in SDG 5 and questions of peace and security principally peace in uh, SDG 16 may be um, are, are, are something of a, a salutary moment to, to to highlight that you know some progress has been achieved in in how we conceive of what peace looks like and how we uh, do work towards peace um, moving forwards. I think it sounds like you know a lot more about that than I do, <laughs> so I can only give the, the briefest of, of answers to it because I, I, I simply don't know as much about the, the workings of the UN or the SDGs um, as, I, as I could do to, to fully answer that question. Um, I do think it is interesting, though, that in 
conversations around FFP. I don't think we're necessarily hearing language around development that much. It is much more the, the language of security and, and peace building, as you say. And I think anything that's coming from the WPS agenda. Um, and I think as well, perhaps there is, and this is a, I don't think this really answers your question, but, but kind of an adjacent point. I think there could be more thinking about what you're describing there, about what feminist civil society's understanding of peace and what, what a feminist peace might look like for feminist civil society. I think there could be more discussion and debate around that um, in the public sphere, because again, I think, and this is a, a long-standing critique of the WPS agenda, um, that it's very focused on the harms that are done to women, as opposed to envisioning or imagining what um, feminist post-conflict reconstruction or, or feminist peace building might look like. Um, but if, as you seem to be suggesting there, you think that the SDGs are a movement or a positive movement in that direction, then fantastic, that sounds great. I mean, there's a, a, a small example of that in the way that the, um, you know, de, de, depart, de, the Department for Development is working together with uh, the, 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 the Foreign Office in Germany um, and that their uh, policies of aid and uh, but budgeting, gender budgeting go hand in hand in, the, in both departments. They are um, offering support uh, for uh, projects that have elements of gender equality uh, in them. Um, you know, up to 85% of the budget goes to that sort of project. So, you know, they're <laughs> economically um, able to, to do that. But, um, and also I think the recognition that, um, that that was there in the WILP that you needed uh, equality, you needed social security, you needed to tackle violence against women and girls, you needed to tackle the, 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 the violence uh, the structural violence of poverty in order to have uh you know societies that were were, were peaceful and now of course um you know until you bring in the department for the environment and you have them all sort of work, working uh on climate um you know on on the climate as an, an issue that is very much connected with peace then i can't i can't see how um it, it can be successful Okay, Nova, would you like to add something to that? <laughs> okay, well, I hope that has answered your question. Uh, Thomas, I wanna take the opportunity now to thank our speakers uh, for, for accepting the invitation and for sharing this afternoon and very early morning in Seattle, their insights and expertise uh, on the questions of women uh, throughout history in international politics. Thank you so much, Ingrid, Nova and Jennifer. It's been such a pleasure to have you here. And I also want to thank our attendants for uh, joining us today uh, and for their questions. It has been an extremely uh, motivating and interesting uh, roundtable, and I've also learned a lot of new things. So I want to thank you all again, and I'll wish you all a very good afternoon and evening and a very good morning and afternoon and day in Seattle. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.